on World News Tonight. Goodbye guns. Biden bids Afghanistan was adieu amidst rising Taliban tensions. Assassins apprehended. Haiti hunts down the masterminds behind the presidential killing that left the country in chaos. Variant immunity. Pfizer announces a new booster shot that could end the variant war starting with Delta. Awaited return. One furry predator proves his only hunger is for his owner's love in a nationwide stage. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is the Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News tonight. We start off today's coverage from the United States. U.S. President Joe Biden moves up his timeline to pull troops from Afghanistan. He's defending his decision amidst intensifying pressure from the Taliban as they rapidly make gains. Today, answering criticism and questions, the president defended his decision to end the war in Afghanistan August 31st. I judge that it was not in the national interest of the United States of America to continue fighting this war indefinitely. Long before he became commander-in-chief, Mr. Biden, who made multiple visits to Afghanistan, was himself a vocal critic of keeping U.S. forces there indefinitely. Achievable goals, he said, happened long ago. To get the terrorists to attack us on 9-11 and deliver justice to Osama bin Laden. But dangers remain real and expanding. After the drawdown was announced in April, Taliban fighters rapidly gained ground against Afghan forces. Some Republicans say removing American forces will embolden groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. The president flatly rejected the U.S. would bear responsibility for bloodshed among Afghan civilians. No, no, no. It's up to the people of Afghanistan to decide on what government they want. This direct message to critics. Let me ask those who want us to stay. How many more, how many thousands more Americans, daughters and sons are you willing to risk? After sacrifices made by a generation of American warriors, the president said he is satisfied the job is done. In a preliminary study, scientists said the heat wave that swept across Western North America in late June, killing hundreds of people, would have been virtually impossible without climate change. But researchers are still struggling to explain such a spike in temperatures. After a heat wave gripped parts of the United States and Canada for days last week, an international collective of scientists has published a report which says that the extreme heat would have been virtually impossible if it wasn't for the effects of climate change. The death toll in the U.S. state of Oregon alone has topped 100, while the Canadian province of British Columbia saw hundreds more deaths than usual. People need to realize that heat waves are killers, and they are by far the deadliest extreme event. Heat preparation and preventing death during heat waves need to be a number one priority for every city authority. The group of scientists estimated that last week's astonishing temperatures were a one in a thousand year occurrence, but warned that if current greenhouse gas emissions continue, such an event could start happening every five to ten years by the 2040s. The June heat wave was far beyond the norm for the Pacific Northwest, with the authors of the report suggesting two possible explanations. Either that a number of factors contributed to producing a very rare event made worse by climate change, or that climate change has altered the Earth's atmospheric conditions so that such heat waves are more common than previously thought. The new research does not, however, come as a complete surprise. On a global level, climate change has made heat waves more common, more extreme, and longer lasting. Haitian police killed four suspects in the assassination of President Jovenel Moise and arrested six more, including two Haitian Americans, as authorities saw the masterminds behind the killing that stunned the Caribbean nation. Haiti's police said Thursday they have killed or apprehended the suspected killers of President Jovenel Moise and are hunting for the masterminds behind the assassination. In a televised news briefing, authorities called for calm after hundreds of residents clamored outside a police station in Port-au-Prince where the suspects were being held, shouting, burn them, and setting fire to a vehicle they presumed belonged to the assassins. One of the suspects seized Thursday is a U.S. citizen, the Washington Post reported, 
And another among the detainees may also be a Haitian American, the Post said, citing Haiti's Minister of Elections. Other suspects were killed Wednesday by Haitian security forces in a fierce firefight that lasted late into the night. Moise was shot dead early Wednesday at his home by what officials said was a commando of trained killers. His violent death plunges the poorest country in the Americas deeper into chaos amidst political divisions, hunger and widespread gang violence. It has also generated confusion about who is the legitimate leader of the country of 11 million people. Moise had just this week appointed a new prime minister, Ariel Henry, to take over from interim prime minister Claude Joseph, although Henry had yet to be sworn in when the president was killed. Joseph, however, has remained in charge, running the government response to the assassination, appealing to foreign governments for support, and declaring a state of emergency. The U.N. Special Envoy for Haiti said on Thursday that Joseph will lead the Caribbean nation until an election is held and urged all parties to set aside their differences. There certainly are tensions. There are certainly people on all sides of these issues. That's why it's important that dialogue happen and that the Haitian authorities and Haitian stakeholders have a dialogue so that a way forward can be started one that gives the people of Haiti the opportunity to decide who their next government is. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the U.S. is also urging an election to be held this year. We know that free and fair elections will facilitate a peaceful transfer of power to a newly elected president. And we certainly continue to support Haiti's democratic institutions. Since he took office in 2017, Moise had faced mass protests against his rule, first over corruption allegations and his management of the economy, then over his increasing grip on power. Officials have so far not given a motive for his killing. Dubai authorities were investigating an explosion on the container ship carrying flammable materials which unleashed a fireball at one of the world's busiest ports and sent shockwaves through the city. Giant orange flames soar above Dubai's Jebel Ali port. The blaze was sparked by an explosion on a ship preparing to dock at around 11.45 in the evening. Its shockwave was felt across the city. Residents report seeing a fireball shoot into the sky. Officials say it was a natural accident and claim that no one was injured as the ship's 14-strong crew had been evacuated. According to initial information, the fire in Jebel Ali port broke out on board a small-sized container ship. No casualties were reported. Dubai police say three of the 130 containers on the vessel held flammable material. Jebel Ali is the ninth largest port in the world and the biggest in the region. It contributed 23% of Dubai's GDP last year, serving as both a critical global hub and a point of entry for essential goods for Dubai and the surrounding Emirates. It's also the biggest port for American warships outside of the U.S. and is capable of handling aircraft carriers. Dubai authorities have opened an investigation into the explosion. The extent of the damage from the blaze is still being established. We have some good news for you. Humanoid robots that can make facial expressions to show emotion could be seen around Asia from next year, helping the elderly and the isolated. This is Grace. She's a humanoid robot built to help the elderly and those isolated since the COVID-19 pandemic. Created by the Hong Kong team of Hanson Robotics, Grace can measure your temperature with a thermal camera and speak to you in English, Mandarin and Cantonese. I can do all kinds of things for elderly people. I can visit with people and brighten their day with social stimulation, entertain and help guide exercise, but also can do talk therapy, take bio readings and help healthcare providers assess their health and deliver treatments. But Grace's biggest feature is that she can express emotions. Founder David Hansen said Grace has 48 major facial muscles that enable her to make different facial expressions. Hey Grace, um, why don't you look at my face, thank you, and um, uh, I'm going to show you a smile and let's, uh, let's see what your smile looks like. Okay, yeah, look, or sad. Oh yes, reacting a little sad if I feel pain. Um, and then uh, maybe uh, like 
imagine a big loud noise happens. Bam! So, um... This facilitates trust and engages users to feel as if they're interacting with humans. Grace is set to be fully deployed in parts of Asia by next year. The demand has been rising for robots that can help humans. That's why Nicholas Carlesi created the Jellyfish Bot. The Jellyfish Bot eats trash in the sea. It's a robotic sea cleaning boat that sucks plastic bags, empty bottles, and surgical masks from the water. Around the size of a suitcase, this robotic boat can even pick up trash from the narrow spaces cleaners with nets cannot reach. The Jellyfish Bot can go anywhere, making not only the earth greener, but also the lives of cleaners much easier. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back and now on to the updates of the COVID crisis. Pfizer is seeking emergency use authorization in the U.S. for a third dose of its COVID-19 vaccine, claiming that a booster shot within a year could curb the spread of variants. Pfizer said on Thursday that it will ask U.S. regulators to authorize a third booster shot of its COVID-19 vaccine within the next month, based on evidence of greater risk of reinfection six months after inoculation and the fast-spreading Delta variant. Pfizer's chief scientific officer, Mikhail Dolston, said a recently reported dip in the vaccine's effectiveness in Israel was mostly due to infections in people who had been vaccinated in January or February. Pfizer did not release the full set of Israeli data on Thursday, but said it would be published soon. But Pfizer stressed that data from Israel and Britain suggests that even with waning antibody levels, the vaccine remains around 95 percent effective against severe disease. Dolston said that early data from the company's own studies shows that a third booster dose generates antibody levels that are five to tenfold higher than after the second dose, suggesting that a third dose will offer promising protection. He said that multiple countries in Europe and elsewhere have already approached Pfizer to discuss booster doses and that some may begin administering them before a potential U.S. authorization. Meanwhile, U.S. regulators said late on Thursday that Americans who have been fully vaccinated do not need a booster COVID-19 shot at this time, writing, quote, we are prepared for booster doses if and when the science demonstrates that they are needed. France warned its nationals against traveling to Spain or Portugal on holiday because of a spite of the COVID-19 cases caused by the highly contagious Delta variant. To give us more updates on this, we have other there in a world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna joining us from Normandy in France. Chetana? Yes, Shanali. France currently allows people to travel to all other EU members as long as they are fully vaccinated or present a negative PCR or antigen test on their return. But Europe Minister Clément Bern pointedly advised the French against crossing the Pyrenees mountain to Spain or Portugal. Bern added that France, which fears being hit by a fourth wave of coronavirus infections this summer, was weighing restrictions on travel in Europe over the spread of the highly infectious Delta mutation. Bern said France was closely following the situations in countries where the flare-up is very fast, singling out the Spanish region of Catalonia where Barcelona is situated and where many French people go for recreation. Portugal's Foreign Minister Augusto Santos Silva acknowledged that the health situation in his country had worsened and said France's concerns were understandable. But Beyond's remarks caused alarm among French tour operators who accused the government of sowing confusion. Last week, nearly half of Portugal's population was again placed under nighttime curfew after the number of daily new cases topped the 2000 mark for the first time since mid February. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was Adha Dharana World News Special Correspondent Chetan Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. A booster shot from Sinovac may be in healthcare workers' near future over in Thailand and Indonesia as rising infections toll on the medical sector and frontline workers. Indonesia and Thailand are considering booster shots for medical workers immunized with the vaccine made by China's Sinovac. It comes as concerns grow about Chinese vaccines and their effectiveness against new and more transmissible variants. In Thailand, a leaked health ministry memo showed a comment warning not to give Pfizer booster shots to medical workers. The quote was made by an unnamed official 
who said that such a move could undermine confidence in the effectiveness of Sinovac. Some data has shown Sinovac's vaccine is effective against hospitalisation and severe COVID-19 cases, but there is no detailed data yet on its effectiveness against the highly transmissible Delta variant. China said this week its vaccines are safe and useful. That hasn't stopped Singapore from excluding people who received Sinovac shots from its count of total vaccinations due to a lack of data, especially against the Delta variant. Turkey and the UAE have also started giving boost shots to those inoculated with Chinese vaccines. The issue is a major challenge for Southeast Asian countries, which have relied heavily on China's vaccines due to tight supplies of Western products. Malaysians struggling amid a strict lockdown are flying white flags outside their homes as a plea for help. To give us an update on this, we have Abdul Nobel News Special Correspondent Avantika Gunasekaran joining us from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Avantika? Yes, Shanali. The hashtag Bandera Puti, or white flag, campaign gained momentum on social media last week to help low-income families signal distress. In response, neighbours, celebrities and businesses have offered to help, providing food and other essentials. Malaysia has been under a nation, nationwide lockdown since 1st June to rein in a surge of COVID infections. Emotional stories of families with depleted savings surviving on one meal a day have made the news in recent weeks. Suicides have gone up, with police data showing that over 400 people have taken their own lives over the first five months of the year. On Facebook, several hashtag Bandera Puti groups have been created to help users post pictures and addresses where assistance is required. Others shared photos of groceries and essential items they could spare, as well as information on nearby food banks. Many households had not earned any income for six weeks and were worried about securing food going forward. Businesses have also jumped on the campaign. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was Adhidhar Nobel News Special Correspondent Avantika Gunasekharan reporting from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Undocumented migrants on a hunger strike in a Brussels church met with the UN reporter on extreme poverty and human rights nearly seven weeks after they stopped eating in an attempt to force the Belgian authorities to give them a right at work. Nora al Matrushi was introduced as part of the UAE space program, making her the first Arab female astronaut. Around a dozen demonstrators staged a protest against the Tokyo 2020 Olympics as the Olympic torch arrived in the Games host city. Despite authorities' announcement to hold the Games in the Tokyo without spectators, the protesters called for a complete cancellation of the Games, citing rising COVID-19 infections across the capital. Two people were seriously injured while nine others suffered bruises after a hot air balloon crashed in the popular tourist town in the southern island of New Zealand. And finally tonight, an innocent 18-month-old lion which was seized last week by Cambodian authorities was finally reunited with its owner as the Prime Minister sees love beyond regulation. A defanged, declawed lion has been returned to its owner after Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen intervened. The 18-month-old animal was seized last week by local authorities. Hun Sen said in a post on his Facebook page that the case was a special one because the owner fed the lion from a young age and loves him as a family member. The Prime Minister added that Gua must keep the lion in a cage to protect family members and neighbours and ensure it's properly fed. The 154-pound male lion was transported back home from the Phnom Tamal Wildlife Rescue Centre. Authorities tracked the animal down in the capital Phnom Penh's Bunkeng Kang district after videos of it went viral on TikTok. At the time, an Environment Ministry spokesperson said it was a rare species smuggled from abroad. He added that according to the law, people don't have the right to raise wildlife at home. Animal rights organisation PETA says exotic animals should never be purchased from dealers or pet shops and warns of the dangers of the animal trade. 
Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.